Just before we begin this video, I'd like to let people know that by becoming a Patreon or donating £5 or more, you'll be given special access to my unreleased review on Western anime theme songs. Links in the description below. Hello everybody, my name is Nick Starman and welcome once again to this anniversary special, where in celebration of the one year anniversary of The Missing Coach Part 3, I've decided that not only will we be doing a 3.5 review, but also spend every week of this month looking at the plethora of Thomas the Tank Engine games, starting from its earliest days to the more recent additions, or at least the ones I'll be able to get my hands on. Now, I have already talked about Thomas games in the past, and also looked at one in particular from Japan called Kakensha Thomas Tanaka Matachi on the PlayStation 1. So, for this review, I will not be looking at that game again, and instead insist you click below or above to check out that in the meantime. From what I have learned from this research and exploration, there is a lot of Thomas games out there. Some with more variety to the gameplay, and some that are just your basic children's games that only hardcore fans would play, and not really anyone who's been given the opportunity to play an actual interesting game. But, nevertheless, they are here in all their cheap and boring glory. So, for each video, we will be looking at a variety of games from specific eras of gaming. Starting off with games on DOS and Amiga, moving on to cartridge games for the Nintendo and Sega consoles, before transitioning to the digital age with CD-ROM PC games and finalising with a variety of others, including some of the more recent mobile games. As an added bonus, each game I look at during the week I will attempt to play over on my Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash streams on Thursday and Sundays to give you a better look into the variety of this cash grabbing. So, without further ado, let's dive into our first part and take a ride back into the days of floppy disks, coding, and ear trauma, and enter the not so Starwind zone, but could be Starwind zone, zone. Now, in the early days of video games, it wasn't surprising to realise that every show and its dog had a game in some shape or form, and for Thomas, this was no exception, with one of the earliest examples being a grandstand handheld device released in 1984, and naturally, it looks like garbage. But, as you know through standards, it's a very rare piece of garbage considering how obscure it is. I mean, look at those graphics, Game & Watch has got nothing on this. But for this video, we'll be looking at three games in particular that release strictly on the DOS and Amiga systems. And although these came out on other systems too, these two versions are the most complete due to the amount of disk space it could handle compared to the others. Whether that means they're any good is another question entirely. The first game released was the 1990s Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, developed by Alternative Software and released first on the ZX Spectrum and Amstrad CPC with horrific results, where Thomas looks like he's auditioning for a trip to the moon while the theme song pours battery acid down your ear. <laughs> before realising they could do better and later releasing it on the Commodore, DOS, Amiga and Atari ST in 1992 to a much more welcomed result. In the game you play as Thomas as you are tasked with picking up items and delivering them to their destination before the time runs out. There are seven levels with a progressive climb of difficulty, first starting with you going from A to B with minor obstacles, to a sea of dead ends, junctions, decoy items, leaves for some reason, and every engine on the island wanting the settler grudge with you by ramming into you. Compared to other games at the time, it gives you the free choice on how you wish to progress, by having a selection screen with all the levels unlocked to begin with, so if you feel like being everyone's punching bag, you can go right to the final level and start to question whether Diesel was right about steamies. The controls are pretty straightforward as well, as being planted on the tracks, you've only got to worry about going backwards, forwards and changing at junctions, while varying your speed and your vocals for when you get sandwiched between Toby and Bill. Or Ben, I have no clue which one it is. Additionally to this is the added bonus rounds where you race against the other characters for additional points, where you find yourself slamming the buttons like you're clashing Kamehameha waves in Budokai before friendliness is gone and you're back to buffer bashing. Despite the varying in difficulty, maze courses and races, getting to the end of the level isn't that difficult so long as you keep an eye on the picture at the bottom to see how far the sun has crossed the screen, which acts as your timer for each level, 
with the occasional reminder from the fat controller with the most northern accent possible. Hurry up, Thomas. Once you've completed all seven, it tallies up your score and you go back to the home screen where you can either do it all again or give a go at the memory card game either against a friend or with the computer, featuring both season one and season two characters. Although some of them really not looking like they want to be there, especially Duck who looks really pissed off. I think this is actually a pretty good game for the time, and in comparison to other games on our list, still stands up to this day and doesn't have many issues to it. The sprites are detailed, the difficulty curve is fair, and despite there being a score, it doesn't really make much of a difference to the overall experience, and I can imagine many people playing this with their friends to see who could get to the end the fastest for hours, and it didn't seem to go unnoticed as one year later, it got a sequel. In 1993, Alternative Software decided to rework the game and release it as Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends 2, or Thomas's Big Race, in which this time, instead of delivering items and avoiding death, the Fat Controller decides to put all his engines to less use and have them race against each other across the island, in order to settle the argument of what if Gordon's high speed abilities were suppressed for the sake of fairness. This game is pretty much just a racing game where you race against the computer or your friends across four different stages on the island, navigating your way through the multiple dead ends and junctions that come your way, added with the usual obstacles of other engines launching themselves into you, but with new pieces such as signals, traffic lights and road crossings. You have a selection of eight characters to pick from who are recycled sprites from the previous game, one being unique that is Bertie, who has a separate course compared to the engines, but still keeping to the same level of difficulty to make it fair. What adds to this dynamic of the races is the use of fuel gauges where you must fill up at the placed water towers and petrol stations across the course in order to reach the finish line, or else just face a game over screen where your opponent finishes it on the bottom screen. Another fun piece of the races is the use of bonus checkpoints that you can find in the siding, where, if completed by collecting the letters, transports you further down the line, either ahead or behind the other racer, depending on how long it took to do so as it doesn't really make much of a difference than if you avoid it altogether, but if you feel like a bit of a flex, then go right ahead. All the races are random, so you'll never race the same character twice, and instead of progressing through the stages normally, you go into the options section to choose your character, stage and difficulty, once again having everything unlocked to you and your friends the moment you start so there's no element of grinding. I think Alternative Software took into mind the competitive idea of the previous game and just gave kids a basic racing multiplayer experience that they could play again and again, and much like what Beanox did with Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled, equalised all the characters so everyone wasn't rushing to the overpowered one and could play as their favourites. Although I think it's a bit of a cop out having Bill and Ben separately when they're just the same sprites. I could see this game going down well with fans, especially at parties with the controller being passed back and forth to echoes of laughter all night. And sadly, this was the last game of this series to be released, as with it being 1993, there were bigger console opportunities on the horizon, and we wouldn't see anything similar to this until later down the line in the 2010s. But, for what we were given, this was a sturdy game. After this point, companies started leaning towards more of the mainstream systems that were out at the time, specifically to a Japanese market, and these consoles became home to educational based games such as Thomas the Tank Engine's Fun Move Words game, also done by Alternative Software. But there was one other game that, although it was pretty basic and very common on PC systems, still was pretty fun to play and had a good overall presentation, despite it being near to impossible for me to install the damn thing. After the release of Thomas's Big Race, Alternative Software decided to, instead of progressing with a third game, which I think would have been a great idea, moved into a different area of gaming and created 1995's Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends Pinball on the Amiga, Amiga CD32, Commodore and IBM PC, showing that anyone and anything can become a pinball game. Now, I know nothing about pinball, but whenever I play it, I just hit the ball until the music and pings play in a specific way, and apparently that's a good thing I guess. I don't know, I'm not a pinball wizard, insert what would be the song but due to copyright I can't. But yes, this is a pinball game, and a pretty one at that. You get some pretty nice looking pixel work of the characters, you get four unique pinball tables themed around Thomas, James, Percy and Toby, 
Nice little covers of the theme songs, although Toby's and James's seems to have been flipped around for some reason, but that's not an issue to me. And depending on where you play it, it runs smoothly and the sensitivity of the paddles are pretty decent. Of course, you can't exactly get pinball wrong, and I would be surprised after the last two games and the library of other games, alternative software would manage to screw this up. But I am sure there are some pinball fanatics out there who may say otherwise, but I don't know. I enjoyed it, and if you're any good at Amiga or DOS emulators, to give it a try, because I could only play this on a website, and it was laggy compared to the actual game. So that's it. Free games, one company, and plenty of nostalgia being thrown in my direction. If you ever want to try these games out, I would highly recommend it, as they have good replay value, and if you have a friend who's also a Thomas fan, it's a good bit of competitive fun on top of it. If you would like to see more of these games, or at least two of them as I couldn't get pinball to work, then check out my Twitch channel in the links below. But until then, that is the end of part one of our anniversary special. I hope you enjoyed it and tune in for next week's episode where we will look at what Sega and Nintendo have to offer. As always, to remember to like, share, subscribe, stick it on a badger, attach it to a brick, mail it to a bomb because it like a surprise, and if you can, spare some change, Governor, by donating the links below. And remember, by becoming a Patreon or donating £5 or more, you get access to the unreleased review on Western anime themes. But until then, I've been Nick Starwind, you have been my audience, and I shall see you next time.